Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining today's training. My name is Meg Given and I'm the Deputy Director of Switchboard, a one-stop resource hub for refugee service providers in the United States. I'm joined by a co-host today, my colleague Rebecca Mulqueen, who you'll be hearing from throughout the chat. Uh, we are so thrilled to be uh, sharing a training to you, with you today on the topic uh, called I was already burned out and now this strategies for staff and supervisors to mitigate burnout, vicarious trauma and other occupational hazards. Um, we'll go ahead and dive right in with a few logistics in Zoom before turning it over to today's facilitators. All attendees right now are joined in listen only mode. Uh, if you are having any trouble, you can switch between phone and computer audio at any time. You'll find the audio settings in the bottom left corner of your screen. Just because you're not able to unmute today doesn't mean we don't wanna hear from everyone on the, today's training. So please don't hesitate to send your chat messages. You can send them to all panelists and attendees in the two field to make sure that everybody joining today can see what you've written out. We also would love to hear your questions throughout. We'll have plenty of time for Q&A at the end of today's session. Under Q&A, you can type in your question or you have the option to click the thumbs up icon to upvote another participant's question. Um, you can submit questions with your name or anonymously, depending on your preference. I wanna mention quickly that today's session is being recorded. So any colleagues who may have wished to join but were unable will find the recording on our website within 24 hours. You will be sent a link from Zoom via email to that recording along with all the session resources. So please keep an eye out for that. I'm really thrilled to introduce today's facilitators. I'm joined by two experts in the field of staff care and self-care. First, Dr. Ada Yinka Akinshulure Smith, licensed psychologist and professor at the City College of New York and Bellevue Program for Survivors of Torture, as well as Kristen Gaskovit, uh, founder of Humanitarian Empathy and Refugee Trauma or Heart of Aid Work. I'm gonna hand it right over now to Yinka and Kristen to get started. Thank you so much for having us. We're both so excited to be here and to be meeting with all of you. So our hope is that by the end of today's webinar, you will be able to do certain things. First of all, that you will be able to identify types of occupational hazards related to emotional distress. Mm -hmm. And that you'll also be able to define two to three promising and emerging practices and organizational responses to these hazards that you will recognize how COVID-19 has impacted emotional well-being within your agency. And that you'll develop an organizational response to distress. And finally, that you will also develop a personal response to distress. As you can see, Kristen and I will be going back and forth uh, to share this um, webinar with you. Absolutely. And this webinar is going to be a little bit different from some that you're used to because we're going to use a lot of opportunities to make it more like a workshop. There'll be a lot of opportunities for you to reflect for yourself, um, obviously participate in the chat, but also just take in the information and sort of see what it means for you, for your organization and what you want to have, have happen next. So in order to do that, we're gonna ask you right now to go ahead and look for some paper and pens or crayons or markers or anything that might be fun to write with so that you can remember Remember some of this later. Just yeah, and well, to start up, we're gonna look at some occupational hazards and we can move to the next slide. So we wanna begin by a few quick definitions, a review of definitions that I'm sure all of you have heard about. These are four terms that are complementary, but yet they're different from each other. They're related, but they are a distinct phenomenon. So just to remind you, burnout. Burnout is something that's triggered by workplace stressors. Things like poor pay, unrealistic demands, heavy, intense workload, long shifts, um, you know, inadequate supervision, these are experiences that one could have in any occupation. The next one is secondary traumatic stress, which is 
it has been defined as the result of bearing witness to a traumatic event or a series of traumatic events. And often what we see with STS, uh, secondary traumatic stress, is that it can lead to PTSD-like symptoms. Um, and then we have vicarious trauma. That describes the transformation of our worldview due to exposures to traumatic images and stories. This often is accompanied by intrusive thoughts and imagery and difficulty ridding ourselves of the traumatic experiences that our clients recount to us. There are those who have argued that vicarious trauma, aka VT, is the result of many uh, secondary traumatic events. And finally, what we're focusing on here, compassion fatigue. This is a different source of stress. It's involvement it, it involves the relationships with clients and their families in which service providers witness the trauma or of suffering of their clients. It's really the culminative effect that causes physical, mental, and spiritual distress symptoms in the provider. Compassion fatigue is often characterized as the cost of caring for others in emotional pain. It's a profound emotional and physical erosion that takes place when helpers, service providers, are unable to refuel or regenerate. And it, the last thing I'll say here is that when we think about the definitions of compassion fatigue and vicarious trauma, they both include a loss of meaning, purpose, and hope. Um, and so, you know, in, in, in kind of extending that to thinking about treating traumatized clients, it's emotionally, it's emotionally challenging for those of us who are clinicians, who are service providers. And as, as I said earlier, we can pay a price. But what we want to understand is that regardless of the construct, the bottom line here is that there is a toll which results from working with people who are traumatized. And managing that troll, that toll, sorry, can may make the difference between a pers a professional who has a thriving lifetime career versus one who leaves due to the pain and burden of the work that we're faced with. So as we're getting started, we'd like to know uh, a little bit about who all of you are. Um, but as there are so many of you, we've decided that this would be best in a poll. So uh, Rebecca is going to open this for us. And what we're going to ask you to do is identify yourselves. Are you a direct service provider, a program manager, or supervisor, a director, or other leadership role or other? And I understand that some of you probably wear multiple hats. So just choose the one that best identifies you based on these. Okay, so we have a lot of direct service providers, a few program managers and supervisors, and then directors and other. Fantastic. So now that we've asked you that, we've got another question for you, especially now that you understand how these polls work. Um, does your organization have a staff care program already? Um, the answer options are yes, we have a formal program to support staff. Yes, we have informal practices to support staff, but nothing formal. No, or I don't know. So go ahead and answer that for us, just so we have a sense. Okay, so a lot of you have formal or informal practices. That's fantastic. Some of you have none. And a good amount of you don't know, which is something that we'll also talk about. Excellent, thank you. So thank you for sharing that information with us. Um, you know, what we are hoping to do, as we'd mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, is to really begin to talk with you or continue if you've already started conversations um, about best ways to support yourself, but also to support the staff within your organization to make sure that compassion, compassion for yourself and for the organization is part of an integral part of the work that you do.
Should we and go we ahead and move this. on? All right. Yes. Oh, excellent. So a lot of people sort of have a, a hard time understanding the, the combination of staff care and self-care. Um, and so I want to break this down for just a second, and then we're going to look at some of these responses that you guys have given and see where we're at. But um, why are we putting these things together? Well, as we've explained, these are occupational hazards that we're talking about. And by that, we mean they're a direct result of the work that we've decided to do. Um, and when we talk about something like um, compassion fatigue and vicarious trauma, as Yinka explained, those include a loss of sense of purpose. And I don't know about you, but I know a lot of us tend to define ourselves at least in part by the work that we do, meaning that it's how we introduce ourselves. It's one of the first things we say. We might find ourselves advocating for our clients even while we're at dinner with family or friends. It matters to us. And so once the work stops mattering, it's bigger than just a bad day. Um, and it bleeds into everything else. So how does this impact the work? Well, of course it decreases our connection and our empathy with our clients. And when we're distressed, we work harder, but we get less done in the same amount of time. So it can lead to a decreased sense of follow through for our clients and our colleagues. And even if our clients don't directly notice our distress, our distress will mean that we're not giving them our 100%. We're not giving them our full ability. ability. Um, and it may mean that we're really overwhelmed and we're taking time off, which if we haven't planned for, might directly impact their appointments. Um, so that's how it impacts the clients. But then as the organization, it impacts our organizations quite a lot. Um, as, as obviously higher turnover as a result of all of this. And that leads to a loss of income, frankly, on the bottom line for our agencies, because it takes a lot of investment to support new staff. And generally we do that in order to help them grow and nurture them to continue in our organization or similar organizations. But if they're burning out or if they're so overwhelmed that they can't do it anymore, if they're disconnected, uh, we lose that. Equally so, organizations with high stress and high conflict levels um, have structural and atmospheric challenges that frankly resemble the traumatic um, worlds that our clients came from. They're chaotic, they're unpredictable, they're unstructured, um, and they're environments where our clients have to react to our agencies instead of where our agencies can react to our clients. And the same goes with us. Um, if our organizations are chaotic and unpredictable and unstructured, we don't have the consistency that we need to know what to expect. And we're always reacting to the next big thing instead of feeling like we can be supported by our organization as we do the work with our clients that we need to. Conversely, of course, well-structured organizations have almost no uh, secondary traumatic stress. And let me just note that when I say structure, I don't mean that it has to be hierarchy. I mean that it has to be a system that we can recognize and identify, a system that allows us and our clients to know what to expect and allows the organization to figure out how to support us best. And finally, the question we get a lot is sort of why now? You know, uh, especially for those of us that have been in this field for 20 years or so, like I didn't have that when I started, so why should we do this now? To be honest, my best answer is I'm really sorry we didn't have this 20 years ago. We should have. We, we didn't see it for whatever reason, but that's not a reflection on whether or not we need it. It's just a reflection on whether or not we had the wherewithal to see it. Um, so why now? Because we need it. We've always needed it. And thankfully, funders and organizations are becoming increasingly aware that these occupational hazards exist and increasing staff care and these are, is an essential component to ensuring high quality service delivery, to making sure that the mission that they have is actually being met. We can't do that if our staff isn't being taken care of. We can't do that if we're not feeling okay. We can't do that if we're not connected with the people that we care about and with the clients we so want to help. So we've been talking already, you can see we're going back and forth between you and the organization and you and the organization because you're, you're not separated in this. We are kind of a village in this, right? Um, and they go together. If we look at this particular survey from 2010, it was 658 psychologists that took this survey. And one of the top reasons that they said for, that there was a barrier to self-care, the reason they couldn't actually access what they needed was lack of time. Well, 
that's probably you and the organization as well, right? What is my caseload? Am I always working 60 plus hours a week? If I am, no wonder I don't want to take extra time out of my week to go do something that I need to. I want to spend that time with my family, with my friends, or by myself. I might be overwhelmed. Um, all of that makes sense and is fair. And at the same time, the less we take care of ourselves, the harder it gets. Um, minimization and denial of issues is an, was another issue for uh, as a barrier. And of course, that goes back to stigma. We need to be able to normalize these hazards so people can feel comfortable coming forward. Um, there's that pervasive narrative of being weak, but we need to change that narrative to being normal. Like this work is hard sometimes. It's going to hurt sometimes. It's going to be difficult sometimes. And if it's hurting frequently and it's difficult frequently, it's gonna to be too much to carry. And yeah, you can do it just like you are right now, but you don't have to do it alone. You have support. So overall, there are these really key characteristics to these barriers. There's stigma, there's shame, there's comparisons. And let me just say really quickly, comparisons, we never, we never come out on top. As soon as I compare myself to somebody else, my brain shows me my deficiencies. Never are we like, yeah, I'm doing really well in comparison. No. So <laughs> as soon as you start doing that, recognize that these comparisons are probably going to be unfair. And that's from your supervisors to you if they're doing that and from you to yourself. Um, expectations are an issue. And then of course, uh, logistical challenges. Um, so occupational hazards have risk factors. And sometimes people who are the most vulnerable to these hazards are the people who are struggling the most with these barriers. So I want you to take a minute and look at these barriers and think for yourself about what you think some of the risk factors might be for someone who might be vulnerable to these occupational hazards. And go ahead and type it in the chat. And while you're doing that, I'm just gonna look at some of the staff care programs you guys are already doing. So while you're listing for yourselves, we are going to put up some of the risk factors that have been noted in the literature uh, as occupational risk hazards here. And we'd like you to take a look and see if you recognize any of these in yourselves. Uh, if you do, make a mark next on your piece of paper. Um, how many marks did you make? Uh, can you think of others that could be added to this list? So one of the others that's not on the list, but is reflected here is, you know, my research has pointed to the impact of emotional intelligence. That is the capacity to be aware of control and express one's emotions and to handle interpersonal skills judiciously and empathetically. Sometimes people who are low in that have a harder time. We have uh, young age as a risk factor up here. I wanna qualify that a little bit not necessarily chronological age, but we're talking about people who are new to the field, who may have limited experience. They might not, as for those of us who have been in the field for much longer, have, have, they might have less developed coping strategies. Uh, so, you know, that poses a risk factor for them. Um, for those of you in the audience who are supervisors and directors, uh, we'd like you, we invite you to think about the risk factors, there may be risk factors that you recognize among your team. But what you should be aware of is that there are, you know, several of these may be unknown to you. Now, it's also important to, to recognize that a list of risk factors does not tell us everything, but rather an accumulation of several risk factors gives us information. So even so, um, we also have risk factors, resilience factors. So we're talking about risk factors, but we also have resilience factors, strengths in us that help protect us to some degree from the occupational hazards. Exactly. And these 
these resilience factors as well are cumulative. The more that we have, the more space that we have, right? So just as organizational uh, resilience factors such as structure decreases vulnerability for staff uh, stress overall, these decrease our stress, but they also help us get out of these distressors when we're in them. Um, so the first one I want to note is social connection, and this is hugely important. Uh, you'll actually hear us talk about social connection probably quite a lot. Um, and it's incredibly hard right now, of course, because of the pandemic. We're going to talk more specifically about the pandemic in a couple of minutes. But even the normal social connection we used to have with our colleagues where we'd pass by somebody's desk and say good morning, or we would go What connections they have. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, it looks like we lost your audio for one moment. Would you mind repeating that last point? Sure, thank you. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm not sure where you lost it. So let me just <laughs> say, um, just like the risk factors there, this is an accumulation of things. And the more that we have, the, the healthier, sort of more tolerant we are for the stressors that may be coming. Um, equally so, when we feel low, these are the things we need to be fostering to get ourselves back on track. Um, so just as organizations have resilience factors such as structure that decrease the vulnerability of staff stress, we have these resilience factors that help us out when we're feeling stressed already and help protect us from the stress around us. The first one we want to talk about is social connection, which is incredibly important. Um, it will come up a lot today. And in fact, I've been guessing that it comes up a lot for you with your clients. We know that for our clients, the more support they have in the community, the more they're connected, the more resilient they will be. But that's true for us too. And of course, like I was saying, and I don't know if you heard, um, our social connection is slightly more strained right now because we don't have the option to stop by somebody's desk and see how their evening was or uh, vent to them about something we find frustrating or brainstorm with them about how to get information that we seem to not be able to get. Um, so the pandemic has made this harder and we'll talk more specifically about the pandemic in a minute, but social connection still needs to be on the top of our list of things that we can do when we're, we're really struggling. Um, another aspect of this is optimism or the ability to make a challenge into an opportunity. A good example of this is all of the people we're seeing going back to school, many of them were furloughed and so they're taking this opportunity. Um, and then of course, recognition of limits to control, right? We only have the opportunity to control ourselves. We might be able to influence other people's behaviors, but we can't actually make them do something. Uh, so when we're getting frustrated because somebody's not getting back to us with something, uh, just sort of recognizing where, where we have control over that circumstance and where we sort of have to let it go. A couple of things that are not on this list, but are important to recognize are past successes. Um, we've all overcome adversity in the past and we're capable of doing so again, but sometimes we need a reminder for ourselves. Um, patience, which of course we are all, I think, learning uh, over and over again during this pandemic period. And faith, for those of you who have spiritual or religious practices, uh, faith can foster resilience and nurture hope. And then finally, it's important to recognize that resilience doesn't necessarily mean bouncing back to our old ways. It actually means sort of strengthening us for the ability to overcome the next stressors. So we won't be the same when we come through whatever's happening, but hopefully we'll be more prepared um, and have some of the same characteristics that helped us through this time. So under normal everyday, usual, regular circumstances, things can be tough and challenging. And then you throw COVID-19, a pandemic on top of it all. It shifts things considerably. And I noticed some of you have mentioned in the chat some of the shifts in your organizations already. So how has COVID-19 impacted the emotional well-being within your organization? Let's take a few minutes on that. And doing things remotely is a whole new ball of wax for those of us like me, 
Luddite here, um, it's been a big shift. Being unsure of oneself, am I reaching out the right way? Is it appropriate? How do I engage my clients? I'm working by myself. Where's the rest of my team? What are the rules and regulations about how we interact and how we engage? And our own concerns for ourselves. You know, which platform are you using for what, when, where, why, how? Uh, do I have the right speed? Okay. Workloads, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you have raised a whole number of the ways in which COVID-19 has, is affecting us. Anxiety, you know, being sick ourselves, looking after our loved ones, our loved ones themselves getting sick. Again, what are we doing here? What is accurate? What is inaccurate in terms of the information that we're getting from the world around us, from our organization? this whole sense of isolation where now the whole socially distant kind of thing uh, creates new barriers, new blockades. Um, for those of us who have children in school or who are caretakers of children in school, what does this mean for them and their education? What does this mean for me caring for them? Hey, I did not sign up to homeschool and now I have to check in and, and be there and be available. Um, you know, a lot of pressures. And, and I just want to highlight that there are parallel processes here, as Christian already mentioned earlier. Our clients are having challenges. We have our own personal challenges. And then we are trying to deal with our clients' challenges. And then our organizations are also trying to restructure, readjust, and adapt to a constantly changing field. I'm in New York City. I think we just found out that our kids are being yanked out of schools again. <laughs> we, you know, we've done the whole back and forth. So am I coming? Am I going? I'm not sure. And then there are the additional. We don't know what's happening next. Which way is this going to go? Like I said, you know, I just learned minutes ago that I think we are now not going to, the kids aren't, are going to be homeschooled again. So confusion there, right? Coping mechanisms that we already had in place, we already relied on. Family, friends, connections, uh, activities, outdoors, um, I don't know, going to the gym, meeting up at a restaurant for a meal, you know, Thanksgiving is coming up. Being with, these are all coping mechanisms that we could have used in the past but now are no longer available to us. So again, we have to swift uh, change things abruptly in midstream. So we're gonna come back to this list of barriers for a moment here because we've just listed an additional amount of stressors and I love how engaged you all are already in this chat. I don't know if you guys saw how quickly and how rapidly everything was coming in, but there are a lot of additional stressors right now from obviously our concerns about kids to concerns about our own health to concerns about how to hear what our, our um, requirements and obligations are and also recognize what our capacity is and it makes for a lot more stress. Um, so going back to this, these barriers, I just wanna revisit it because some of you had the opportunity to start to identify which ones you sort of resonate with. But if you haven't done that yet, go ahead and take out your pen and paper and write these down and just circle the ones that resonate most for you. Um, right now, of course, our, our resilience factors, we have them, but we need to practice them a little bit more because our stress is extra. So our self-care attention needs to be amplified and the level of stress we're experiencing needs, they need to sort of match, right? So if I were to 
I have a glass of water here you guys can see. So if we were to assume this glass of water was our overall tolerance and this water that's in the glass is the stress, right? If I take a sip of water, I have a little bit more space for a little bit more stress. But if I don't, and somebody keeps pouring the water, keeps adding stress, at some point it spills out. So I'm equally overwhelmed and empty because I don't have any more space to take anything in. And that's essentially what's happening when we're not able to find a way to address some of these barriers for ourselves. So I want you guys to look at the barriers that you've addressed for yourselves and give yourself a minute to identify somebody that might be able to help you with this, right? So for example, if it's lack of time, I know a couple of people were mentioning uh, some of the challenges with, with work as language issues um, or the work-life balance being the gender issues and what's put on our, our female staff versus our male staff. Um, or the issues of, you know, what do I do if I do need help and how do I, I manage that? So if lack of time was an issue, then who can help you with that? Would that be a supervisor that you need to work something through with? Is that your partner that you need to work something through with as far as um, kids are concerned and other families concerned? Who, who can help you? Um, and again, we're going back to that social connection because you're not in this alone. Um, and the more that we can get people to connect and think together, the more likely it is you'll be able to find a way to give yourself a little bit of time that you need. Um, if what you're talking about is financial constraints, maybe it is HR you need to be talking to. Are there uh, employee assistance programs if that's something that's interesting to you? Um, or are there other options? I know a lot of people said that their organization used to do uh, yoga and sometimes is doing uh, meditation or mindfulness now, um, but, but what resources are out there? Um, if it was a denial of issues, certainly congratulations if you, if you uh, circled that you're well on your way to addressing that barrier. And then if it's a shame or a guilt issue, I saw somebody uh, said something along the lines of fear of loss of status. Um, and I think that's a really powerful statement, right? If I admit that I'm tired, if I admit that this has been too much this week, if I admit that I need help, what does that say about me? Personally, I will say it says that you are human and this work is hard and uh, we should all know that, but of course we forget it when we're in it because we think we're supposed to be the super humans that our clients sometimes expect of us. But going back to what I can realistically expect from myself, unfortunately I can't always do it all. Um, I saw somebody else say something along the lines of, I don't feel alone, but I don't feel like I'm a part of everything. And I think that was another really good statement to bring up. And going back to this idea of connection, I don't feel a part of everything, but I don't feel alone. Okay, are there other ways that you want to connect with everything? Or actually, are you feeling comfortable with that? Like, does that give you a little bit of freedom that I'm not actually a part of everything anymore? Um, and depending on how you answer that, is there an opportunity to use that for your self-care? So just kind of continuing and piggy piggybacking off um, what Kristen just said, this, this slide really is just to help remind us, uh, again, of, on the one hand, the sense of isolation we can feel, but yet to remind us that there are concentric circles that we function in. So we are that, uh, that you, but then we also have our clients, we are also within our agencies, and we are also within the larger society, you know, and all of these concentric circles impact each other, uh, going back and forth, so that while we are dealing with COVID-19, we are very aware that there are other challenges that many of us face, depending on where you are in the country. You know, there are natural disasters going on, fires, hurricanes. Um, there are other issues, racial, cultural factors, historical factors that are coming to play um, that we are also dealing with. And again, just pointing to the fact that there are these parallel processes that we are dealing with them, our clients are dealing with them, our organizations are dealing with them, and they affect each other. So there is an interactional quality to what we are dealing with, what we're enduring. So we're gonna to pivot to the organizational care plans. And in order to do that, we're gonna look at some key components of um, organizational staff care programming. 
So organizational staff care really is the foundation on which programs run effectively. Um, earlier this year, I had the opportunity to do some research with Dr. Miriam Potosky on secondary traumatic stress and organizational staff care. And in that research, we did a literature review, interviews, and focus groups. And our work echoed everything else that's already out there, which uh, reflects these key pillars that we have up here. Um, the overarching themes of staff care are supportive leadership, reasonable workloads, proactive supervision, peer support, and individual needs, along with physical space. And I'm going to put that one off to the side for just a second. We're going to come back to it because that certainly looks different in a time of COVID than it would have a year ago. Um, but when we're talking about supportive leadership, we're talking about what is your organization doing to support staff, right? Some people have said that their organization has these meetings and these check-ins. Some people are still saying that there are some team uh, building things that are happening. Um, and then others are saying there's an EAP, there's uh, meditation, et cetera. Um, so there are things that are happening, but as your organization normalizing these hazards, right? Uh, so if you think about when you used to be in the office and somebody would mop the floor and there would be that yellow sign that said caution. Is somebody explaining that there are there is caution to be had coming into this work, um, that there are hazards in front of us and we need to know that they're there. And are they looking for funding that's dedicated to the purpose of staff care or writing it into their overall operational um, needs? Are they listening to what staff is saying that they need? Are they hearing you? Um, if there are resources, resources available, are they sustainable? And if they're not, is there opportunity to be flexible and to create support even if there's no financial support? Um, so are they looking at, you know, those of you that have said I, I'm dealing with homeschooling and I'm dealing with work, uh, is there an opportunity to make sure the job isn't specifically nine to five, but there's some, some space there? Is there an opportunity to ensure that staff feels valued, even though they're not in the office? So when uh, Miriam and I were conducting these focus groups, uh, one example that came out was this uh, marble jar example of feeling valued. And the idea was, uh, if somebody helped me with something on a project, I would give them marbles. But then I would also put marbles in my own jar because I collaborated and I asked for help and I was using the team, right? So I could feel proud of myself and value my efforts and theirs. Um, and it was a really nice, easy way to feel like somebody sees what you're doing and values what you're doing. And I'll tell you, this particular organization had a lot of different examples. And by the end of the, the focus group, every other organizational representative there stopped what they were doing and asked if that organization was hiring because everybody wants to work for the supportive organization, right? Everybody wants to work somewhere where they feel valued enough to where leadership is willing to bend where they can and help where they can and make sure that you have the information that you need so that you know what to expect. Um, the next one, of course, is reasonable workload. And a lot of people have said that some of the challenges with workload, of course, are language. If you're the only language speaker in the organization, you end up with the caseload that looks uh, a certain way. Um, equally so, if you find that you are really successful with one type of client, sometimes you end up with that that client all the time. But if those are the clients that take more time or more emotional energy, then the, the workload isn't working right, right? There needs to be some discussion with supervisors about how can we do this differently? Because if the workload doesn't fit into a normal work week, and by workload, I mean, not just cases, but of course, all of the paperwork as well, right? Um, it's, it's, not, it's not sustainable. Um, the next aspect of that is, of course, proactive supervision. I'm doing a similar project right now with another organization where we're looking at staff care. And one of the things that people talk about all the time is that they want their supervisors to ask them about how they're doing. They don't want to have to advocate for themselves. And they'll say, I'm too tired. Like, I'm already advocating for my client and for this and for that. I don't want to have to advocate for what I need to. So proactive supervision means that you're having a regular check-in with your supervisor, that you know when it is, it's consistent, it's always on the books, um, and that you have, I would recommend an actual agenda uh, that consists of certain things each time, including a real check-in. How are you doing? How is the workload? 
How are things going with your clients? What is happening that's making you feel good? What is happening that is making you feel uncomfortable? What do we need to be looking at? Um, and then peer support. A lot of you said that there were peer support options before and maybe they're not as um, available now, which is understandable. Um, certainly some ways of doing peer support are, are peer supervision. There's also some creative things that people have been doing around sort of water cooler, virtual water cooler things. And even uh, I talked to one organization that left a Zoom open so that you could just go in there, right? So maybe you need a transition space. And so you're gonna go and look in the Zoom and see who's there and chat with them for a minute. Um, and then finally, individual needs. What works for me isn't necessarily gonna work for you. And of course, again, we know that when it comes to our clients, but somehow we forget that when it comes to ourselves. So if you're looking at your staff care plan and it consists only of an employee assistance program, it's probably not meeting the needs of everybody. Not everybody is going to take that offer um, because it's not necessarily what they need. They may need more time with their supervisor. They may need to reassess their caseload. They may need to simply feel like you're listening and like you can be flexible on what are the work hours and what are the time off options and what are what's the organization going to do when I take time off? Is that work just gonna sit and wait for me? Or is there is there a plan in place so that I can actually take time off without feeling like I'm just gonna walk back into a bigger mountain of work than I left? Um, and finally, we have to talk about a calm space, right? Um, before COVID, what we would have been talking about is something like trauma-informed care, where a space isn't welcoming just to our clients, but also to our staff, where we maybe have plants like I have in the background here, and we're, you know, we're thinking about it uh, aesthetically as well as how it makes us feel. And now we are stuck at home, and many of us are sharing our office space with our kids and our spouses and our pets. Dining tables. Um, Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's the dining table. It's the bedroom. It's the, whatever. It's not, it's not calm. <laughs> and it's definitely not nurturing. But if we're looking at how can we make this work, the thing that I would recommend is getting to that, that mental space, right? So starting to think about how I start into the work and end the work. What is my routine? Is there music going while I'm having breakfast, but then I, I listen to the last song and I go into work? Is it going to look a little bit like it did when I was in the office and I'm going to chat really quickly hello to the person that sat at the desk next to me or whomever? Um, is, it, uh, is it going to include that I'm going to finish my coffee and like just sort of look at the paper like I did when I was in the office and then go after that to the email, right? What is it going to look like? And making it consistent so that your brain can get ready for this is the start and this, this is where I go to work right? I would recommend in there putting some really deep breaths in um, to get yourself sort of centered and ready. Um, if anyone has ever thought about anything like sleep hygiene and talk to clients about that, it's about the routine as much as what you're doing, because it tells your brain, okay, now I'm shifting gear. Okay, now I'm not worried about the breakfast uh, plates. I'm worried about this. And then at the end of the day, or whenever you're closing down for a couple of hours, having a routine to, to close you out, right? And it might be the exact same routine, checking in with your neighbor, hey, see you later, have a great evening, have a great couple of hours, whatever you used to do when you would go check on clients before when you would leave the office, right? And making sure you have that space, go to do whatever you're going to do, come back, open it up again, close it down, whatever your process is, go to do whatever you do, come back. And Again, it's helping your brain to get ready for those shifts because frankly, we're all incredibly overwhelmed right now and our brains are not functioning the way that they usually do. Um, because when we're overwhelmed, they can't. We can't take in the same amount of information anymore. We can't process things in the same way anymore. We've got too many things that we're trying to remember. So these sorts of spaces will at least help you go from this page to this page and hopefully help you to stay there for as long as you can before you have to go back over to this page or over to this page. So that being said, I mean, one of the things I was really excited to hear was that there are a number of people in administration in managerial positions who are joining us. Because the truth of the matter is, Kristen and I can talk about wellness, compassion, fatigue, and all this, that, and the other. But if there is no recognition 
it goes nowhere. So recognition is the antidote to start. Organizational compassion fatigue has been defined as a toxic work environment that hinders efficiency and limits potential growth. So in order for anything to shift, I mean, we have this thinking outside the box, but there has to be organizational buy-in. Leaders have to demonstrate support. And that demonstration actually has been strongly associated with job satisfaction. So think about it. We set goals and treatment plans for our clients. What about ourselves? What about our organizations? So we need to think both inside and outside the box. You know, how can you, in these challenging times, do things a little differently to ensure that the, the life, the lifeblood of the organization continues? So, you know, Things like we have listed here, I mean, there may be, you know, uh, psychology interns or externs or mental health, uh, mental health counseling interns or externs that can be brought in. Um, pairing new trainees, new people, new employees with more advanced and experienced clinicians for support. Um, you know, complementary approaches have been used. I mean, Unfortunately, now, I mean, we can't really go out and bring masseuse therapists in, which is one of the things we actually had done for us at Bellevue training. They came in trained and we all got to have some downtime to get, you know, these massages. But there are things that we can do, um, you know, that there are a lot of uh, things online, you know. So sometimes, though, the thinking outside the box can be challenging. But think about when you are at your most stressed or overwhelmed. How do you usually respond to new ideas or new strategies? How would you like to respond? What do you need to be able to consider new ideas or strategies? What about recommending something new to your agency? How might they respond? So we invite you to take a few minutes and, and just kind of think about and respond to that. Yeah, it's a because good again, question. Mm -hmm. No, just to jump in, like, how do people respond to new ideas? Because that'll tell you where your organization is. Are they overwhelmed and not listening? Are they defensive? Or are they open, right? Okay, this is great to hear that organizations have been. So we're getting a mix. Yeah, no, we're getting such a range of responses in terms of how organizations are responding. Um, and unfortunately, the, the, the truth of the matter is, and you know, um, anecdotally and evidence research bears it out that when there is no um, awareness, no recognition, and then movement, the environment becomes toxic and you have all the things that go with a toxic work environment and high turnover, unhappy, unhappy staff, unhappy clinicians. And, you know, in our case where we're providing, you know, human services, we're providing treatment services, unfortunately, it trickles down to our clients. As much as we try our best to hang in there. So we're going to, so we're going to come back to this question um, as we develop these staff care plans. So I'm going to have us go ahead and go forward. Um, 
a lot of people in these chats uh, have said something along the lines of we need we need leadership to listen to us we need to be able to organize we need to be able to advocate for ourselves um, and I also hear a lot of people saying I don't want to advocate for myself like that's how is that also my job and I get it but for those of you that feel like that's the best way to get your leadership to listen is to have some of these, these advocacy tools and some of these things that we're saying, uh, these resources are a good start for mm -hmm. help. Um, there will be other resources as we go through. And certainly uh, there are a lot of resources out there, but suffice to say the things to think about when you're thinking about advocacy is the cost of turnover um, that definitely matters to an organization if they're not necessarily keyed into the actual well-being piece of it it's the impact uh, on their image if people are not able to do as well which is also something that that resonates with organizations if they're not necessarily keyed into the well-being piece of it um, mm -hmm. and it's the ability to attract good new possibilities too, right? Um, so those are some key aspects to this that may be helpful to you as you're thinking about advocating, um, but there are plenty of others. So certainly take a look at what is here and, uh, and we'll keep talking about that. And you can tell, we can quote us on this. Please. <laughs> so. We'll come talk, we'll come tell them. Exactly, exactly. Exactly, exactly. And, and it's essential if we, if you're spending all of your time trying to make the point that you're not doing okay, that's, that's not okay, right? And so, um, and it's normal, again, for sometimes this to not feel okay. So we're going to switch again. Uh, and again, we're going to go back to individual and then back to organizational so that you get a little bit of something that you can walk away with that you can physically do while you're also thinking about advocating and working with your teams uh, to change things where you can. Uh, for those of you that are already doing some of this, this will also help to move you forward in the next uh, stage, both for your organization as well as for yourself. So I want you to take out the paper and pens, crayons, markers, whatever it is you have there. Um, and I want you to draw a circle for yourself. And that circle represents one day in your life. And I want you to take a couple of minutes and divide your circle into pies that are associated with the amount of time that you spend doing certain activities, right? So maybe one piece is for work, maybe one piece is for helping with homework, maybe one piece is for sleep, whatever it is, whatever your normal day looks like go ahead and divide it up proportionally based on what you're spending your time on. And we'll give you a couple minutes for that. While you're doing that, I just have to say, I love the resources you guys are sharing with each other mm -hmm. in this chat, it's fantastic. Talk about peer support, I love it. Yeah peer support and increasing connections. Mm-hmm, yeah. So I'm gonna give you about one more minute to finish your pie or your, your circle into a pie. <laughs> So now that you probably have your pie for your day, I want you to look at it again and notice either what you need more of or what's missing. And what do you need to adjust to fit that in? I know it's a big ask because everything seems like it's priority. But just take a moment and look what's missing or what do you need more of? and what needs to adjust and fix it on your little circle pie. Give 
Wait another minute for that. I love it. My next question was going to be, for those of you who feel comfortable sharing, feel free to share what it is you're noticing about your pie. And we already have a couple of comments here. Uh, wanting more time, of course, to um, for your own family tasks. Mm -hmm. yeah. Where is my running time? What Absolutely right. <laughs> yes, what is missing? Exactly. Oh, the sanctuary model. Mm -hmm. Rebecca, I don't know if it's possible to include all of these wonderful links um, when we send this out uh, that are in the chat, but if, if so, that would be great. I will try and add them. Thanks. Time after work just blends and goes so quickly. Yeah, especially when we don't have a change in scenery, right? When you're sort of going from mm -hmm. this view of the room to this view of the room, <laughs> it, it does start to blend. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So everybody's saying they want more time for stuff that is not work. work. We need more time for fun. We need more time for play. We need more time for laughter, even during a pandemic. So let's remind ourselves, let's, let's, let's create a self-care plan. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so, you know, based on the needs and, 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 you know, again, talking about self-compassion, self-care, as opposed to compassion fatigue, self-compassion, um, you know, here, what we're inviting you to do is create your self-care plan. Um, and, you know, on your sheet of paper that you have giving yourself five columns, just kind of following this diagram that we have out here in the first column, what, what are you, what do you want to put in your plan? What has been missing? Could be running time. It could be walking time. It could just be silence for a moment. Um, how often do you want to do this? Um, you know, how often do you want to, you know, is it once a week? Is it, you know, four times? Uh, when would you do this? Would this be in the evening before bed? Would it be first thing when you wake up? Um, who would help you make it happen? Now, this is key because, again, you know, there's been all this isolative stuff going on. So how, who, who are you going to connect to? What I've done um, some trainings and organizations, what I've done is I've asked people to create buddy systems where there's somebody that they do like and they do trust who will check on them, who they will share with what they've accomplished. Sometimes when we have to tell someone else or we have to explain or share, it, it makes us more accountable. It makes us more responsible. And you know, the, in the fifth column, who is gonna, who will help you stay accountable? So in a self-care plan, it, it can also in include not only what you'd like to do, but also what you want to decrease, what you want to do less of. So some of us, and you know, not mentioning anyone in this room here, i.e. me, spent way too much time over the past two weeks looking at the news and waiting for information. You know, and it, it actually, it's funny because when I realized I was doing it, I was thinking, what am I doing? This is what I tell my clients not to do. Why are you listening to the news at 11 o'clock? What good is it going to do you when you try to go to sleep? So for me, I really, I really had to cut back on that. In fact, I had to stop. Um, so, you know, TV, stressful TV, stressful news um, um, consumption, bringing it down, you know, including more healthy coping strategies. What are things that I enjoy that are, are, are healthy for me that, that, that create that sense of wellness and well-being? Um, so these are some things that one wants to think about when we, when we create our, our own self-care plan. 
If I can just add a couple of things that came to mind as I was think as I was reading these chats. Um, another thing I think about with my self care plan, just like with the news that uh, Yinka just mentioned, is what else am I watching? Right. Uh, certainly people in my family really like the cop dramas. I can't watch them with them. <laughs> I, I have to say no on that one. Uh, there's enough seriousness for me in the world to be able to put that aside. But I'm also somebody that's always looking for what else could I do, right? And so I was reading an article today actually, and uh, and I mentioned I noticed somebody in the chat said I'm a single mom, and so I don't have a lot of opportunities to ask for help. There's there's nobody around, and this person in the article had said what they were doing was with their youngest, they were putting them on a Zoom with their grandparents when the or their oldest when the youngest was taking a nap, so that the oldest was occupied and the youngest was asleep, and mom had that little bit of time to figure out what she needed. Um, and so the, there may be options that aren't necessarily as visible and I encourage you to keep looking for them. What makes me feel good? What makes me feel not so good is a really good starter if you're not sure what you need to start with. Uh, just key into to where your mood is. Is it elevated? Is it low? Is it numb? And figure it, figure out from there, so. And so we can go to the next slide and just just here are some samples examples of what could go into a self care plan. Now these are a few suggestions, but you know you may have other suggestions. Um, what else could go into your schedule that would increase your resilience. You know, and I, and I see again trying to check into the chat box um, as I'm, I'm not having too much success doing that, but I'm seeing, you know, practicing hobby with kids, with your kids, getting outside every day. Yes, because it is so easy to just get trapped indoors. Yeah. So gra a gratitude practice, idea, you know, ideas for medication. Uh, diet, exercise, you know, ways of connecting with other people, yeah, midday walks, absolutely. Um, so while we're reverting back to the individual for a hot minute here, for those of you in managerial positions, look at this for yourselves, but also think about it in terms of the organization. You know, thinking back to the slide that we had up on promising and emerging practices, what can you incorporate into your organization now, today, in a few weeks, in a month from now? Because I mean, I don't think things are gonna change that quickly where we're gonna be back in our workspaces. So how do we incorporate this in our organization? And uh, again, to make sure that our staff continue to feel nurtured and cared for. So just as before with the organization, we have some individual self-care resources here. And the first one we've listed is a quality of life scale, which is a little bit like a temperature check. I know a lot of people are taking their temperatures pretty regularly right now to, to double check the COVID symptoms. This is a really good way to double check your compassion fatigue, vicarious trauma, secondary trauma symptoms. Um, so, you know, do a little temperature check for yourself, see where you're at, and then see if you're surprised by that, if it's, uh, not where you thought it was, or if you need to do something different. There are several other options here that I hope you guys will also take in. We can go on to the next slide. And so we've done a lot of talking and, um, you know, trying to balance it by looking at what's going on in the chat. But what we'd like to do now is open it up and, you know, answer questions that are percolating for people. Thank you so much, everyone. I want to echo Yinka and Kristen, who have said, and I'll say that the chat and the Q&A have been so thoughtful and active throughout the session today. So really appreciate your sharing your thoughts on what can be a really challenging topic. I think the first point I want to raise and ask our facilitators to reflect on is among the different responses I'm seeing 
some acknowledgement of the tension between uh, really who is responsible for staff well-being. So we've talked about the role of supervisors and leaders. We've talked about the role of staff, but understanding that when we do those things, we might make staff feel inadequate if they haven't succeeded in doing some of the wellness recommendations that we hear a lot about, or supervisors uh, might feel that despite providing certain options that they think their staff might take advantage of, uh, they are not succeeding or, or not doing enough. So I, I thought I might just ask that as an open question about how you see um, that, that division of responsibility or shared responsibility. So I, I guess I, I'm going to jump in here. <laughs> I guess I see it as a collaboration that the organization is open and willing to have a discussion, but it's not uh, us coming down and saying, okay, you're going to do this, this, this is what we've decided. What I feel is more useful is, and this is also what the research has shown, is that having a conversation, what would you like? This is what we see needed this is what we see necessary and together a collaboration where we come together to decide on what might work best and try it out as opposed to saying it's this person's responsibility you know your management you take care of it but but in order for that conversation to happen there has to be an atmosphere a recognition that this can be a challenge that this is an issue and we want to deal with it before we see before the workplace becomes toxic. Thank I'd you. like to just add, yeah, sorry. <laughs> a couple of things on that. One is uh, from managers to staff or supervisors to staff, a little bit of you know humility. We're not gonna have the right answers. And we say this to our staff when they're working with clients, right? You're not gonna have the perfect solution for somebody. So take the pressure off and have that conversation like Inka just said, there's no reason to think that you can imagine what the best option is, just to have the conversation. And then for our colleagues that are struggling with any of these self-care practices, I totally get it, right? We, are, we have more tolerance and more ability sometimes and we have less other times. So what I always tell people is, even if you start thinking about it, there's a step. Even if you put the YouTube video on for that little exercise thing that you want to do, even if you don't do it, okay, there's a start, right? So if you feel like you have this much bandwidth and you can do 30 seconds of meditation, fantastic. If you feel like you can't do any of it and you want to zone out to Netflix for the next two hours, that's also fantastic. Whatever you need at that moment, great. You'll get to a space where you have a little bit more tolerance, but it is about figuring out how do I listen to myself right now? Do I need the Netflix? Do I need the meditation? Do I need everybody to go away for a little bit? And, and I just want to add one last thing again. I, I know I may be beating this to death, but there is research out there. A study by Lee uh, in 2014 found that the, an organizational commitment promotes job satisfaction and compassion satisfaction. In addition, group cohesion, us working together as a group, really helps promote reducing stress exposure, uh, reducing post, uh, sorry, uh, secondary traumatic stress, and reducing compassion fatigue. So, so, so there is research that supports what we're saying. We're not just saying it because it sounds good. Thank you both for, for those great thoughts on a, a fairly broad question. Really appreciate that. Um, one topic I saw emerge in the chat, and I think a really important one is, uh, would either of you be able to speak to the role of benefits when it comes to staff well-being, um, specifically financial compensation, salary, wages, but also time off and, and other benefits? What role do those things play? Well, they play a huge role. Mm -hmm. um, I can say that with all of the research that uh, we've done, that is one of the things that comes up all the time, right? Do I feel like I am valued? And compensation is a big part of that and benefits are a big part of that. Do I feel like my organization recognizes that I am willing to wear myself down to the bone for this, but I shouldn't have to every day. That shouldn't have to be the default. 
Um, so I do think it's hugely important. I know that it's not always possible, right? So that's true that we have limits and that's where that idea of flexibility comes in again. Mm -hmm. Can I be generous in the way that I am able to be generous with my organization, with my staff? And if I'm gonna say, no, I can't be generous in any way, then I'm not actually seeing my staff in the way that I need to, which is my collaborative partner to getting this done, right? I, an organization is only as good as its staff. And our staff is only as good as the organization supports them to be. So. And that parallel process, because if we can show compassion, kindness for our clients slash patients, what about us? What about our staff? I think that you're, uh, you've touched on this next question several times today, and I can share that this is the most common question we received in the pre-registration survey, and it's the highest upvoted question today during the Q&A. Um, really, what would you say to a staff member who is in the situation where they don't feel valued, they would like to speak to their supervisor or someone in leadership about that, and they're not sure how to do it? So there are a few layers to that, right? Um, they, they don't feel valued and they're not sure how to go about it. If they're really not being valued, there may be safety in numbers there. It might be worth talking to your go. colleagues, right? That's and exactly connecting. where I was gonna go, Kristen. Yeah. <laughs> yep. yeah. And, and seeing if there's a few of you that have had similar experiences. Um, people don't like to think that we ever do anything wrong, right? Like we, we like to think we're right all the time. <laughs> so if you are gonna have a tough conversation, remember those I statements, remember to present what you've experienced, right? I had this one experience, I feel this way. And make sure that you can show your clear pattern that you are seeing. Cause I am guessing that your leadership is not seeing it. I don't think anybody comes into this work intending to be harmful to each other. I just think we get lost in it sometimes. So if you can go into it, assuming the best mm -hmm. with the I statements and with some other people, you'll have a better chance at having a good conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Great, thank you for that. And as I read through the, the great questions that have been submitted, just a reminder, because the chat is very active, we may very well miss questions that are coming in through the chat. So go ahead, all who still have questions, please type those into the Q&A and we'll uh, try to make sure we can cover as much as possible. I see some questions here related to um, the differing roles of supervisors and leaders. We talked about both of those, the supportive supervision piece, um, the proactive supervision piece and the supportive leadership piece. Um, what roles do you think uh, are relevant for both someone in you know, a very a higher up managerial leadership position, uh, as well as someone who might be a direct supervisor where the staff is coming to them one-on-one um, -on -one with concerns? I think the one thing that I would jump in and say, and I mean, Kristen, of course, come in, is also depends on what your role is in the organization. So are you a clinician? Is Are we talking about um, administrative supervision? Or are we talking about clinical supervision? Is, is there, is there, is, you know, because they both might have different functions, but at the same time, they should be people that you can talk to about experiences that you're having that don't feel quite right. Right. And again, going back to research for a second, this can't all hinge on one person, right? right. So you might have one supervisor who is stellar, so good at being keyed into what their staff needs, but if the rest of the organization isn't functioning in that way, you still have a chaotic, unstructured organization that is still going to lead to secondary traumatic stress because I don't know what to expect from anybody. I don't have that consistency. I don't feel safe, right? So when we talk about expectations, we're talking about boundaries, we're talking about safety. And if I already feel stressed and overwhelmed, all of that's gonna be a lot more triggering. And of course, for our clients as well as for us. Um, so I would say that if you feel like you're the one and only person doing this, maybe asking if you can provide support to other new supervisors learning how to do it, maybe recommending that this is really working for you, finding ways to start that conversation and seeing what happens. We've already heard from a lot of organizations there's a no response or a no or a defensiveness when there's a new idea. 
And also there's probably a reason for that. And it's probably a misunderstanding or feeling attacked. And so can we work through that? Is there a way to assume the best in somebody or is, is it really feeling like it's a stuck point? Thank you both uh, for those great suggestions. I saw a few questions related to noticing signs of burnout or signs of distress among others we work with or, or even in ourselves. Um, do you have recommendations for a supervisor, a teammate, or even you know, an individual person looking inward on recognizing when things may not be okay? Yeah, I, I think that there are a number of ways. Um, just not being present. You know, we talk a lot about absenteeism, sorry, absenteeism. One training I did recently, I, I heard a new phrase, which I had not thought about. And I was telling Kristen about this the other day, presenteeism. And that's the reverse where the person is physically there, but they're checked out. They're not, they're not connected. They're not, stuff is not registering. Um, they're having a hard time. Um, you know, so are there difficulties that you're noticing with them connecting with other staff members? Um, you know, the co-worker relationships. Um, are there challenges, you know, following up with clients? Um, you know, they're just not seeing themselves doing what they used to do and you're noticing change. Yeah, those are some of the ways, those are some of the signs and symptoms that all is not well. Um, and it may be around work, but then you have to clarify, is it around the work setting? Is it around clients or is there other stuff that's going on? And just to add to that, uh, if the joy for the work is really not there, if all of a sudden you find yourself sort of blaming your clients, right? Ugh, I have mm. to explain this to this client all the time. That one to me really hurts because yeah. of course that is the antithesis of why we do this. <clears throat> but unfortunately it, it sometimes happens. So if you notice that in yourself or in someone else, it's, it's time to double check what's happening there. Um, I'm a firm believer if you know someone well and you think they're suffering to say so, um, gosh, I noticed that you're really, things don't seem okay. Is there something I can do to help? Uh, hopefully you have a good relationship and they will feel comforted by that and not offended by that. But we generally see it in other people before we see it in ourselves. And, uh, and so if you feel comfortable pointing out to someone, I can say that for me in the last five months, I don't know about you, Yinka, but I have recommended therapists to so many people in my own oh, circle. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Apps. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So just a gosh, I'm worried about you uh, can really help. Great. Thanks again uh, for all these great questions. I see we have a number of comments as well in the uh, chat and in the Q&A, acknowledging all of those. Just want to make sure you know that you, those are being seen oh. uh, as we look through the uh, questions. Um, also, I think that there's a general theme that I might pose, and I, I'm not asking either of you to work a miracle here at what I'm about to say, but there seems to be, you know, this, this acknowledgement that the workload has increased because the needs have increased in recent years, you know, recent months, as we've talked about the increased burden on staff, the clients that we're serving are experiencing that same burden. Um, I think there uh, is, a, is a real challenge there in trying to find time or um, make space for staff care when the work needs to get done and it can't be reduced. Um, that's certainly not something I think we have a solution to, but I'd really welcome either of, of you, if you have thoughts on that really difficult situation. I actually think this goes a little bit back to what Yinka said on thinking outside the box. There are things that have to get done but do they have to get done in the way that we're doing them? Or are we making it somehow more complicated for ourselves? And sometimes it's hard to look at it because we're so used to doing things in a certain way. Um, so is there a way to bring in the team? Is there a way to bring in an intern? Is there a way to give a little bit more to the client themselves to do? Is there a way, I mean, it's an imperfect time for sure right now, but are there other ways we could be doing this that can meet the need that doesn't feel like it's always all on that one person. And I, and I would add to it distributing the burden, the, the type of client. 
So, you know, is, it, is there one person who is, quote, the expert in this area who winds up getting all the heavy, difficult, challenging, traumatized clients? Um, is it, is there things, for example, around language where one person gets all the people from this area who have suffered this kind of trauma? Uh, is there a way to bring in interpreters so we can spread the, the, the love, if you will? Um, so yeah, again, thinking outside the box in terms of how to distribute that work is, is key. Mm -hmm. Well, and to add to that, right, so maybe I'm the only language speaker, but can somebody help me with the follow-up stuff? So maybe I don't have to see the whole case through from start to finish, but I can put down what the plan is. Um, and I noticed in the chat that somebody mentioned that, of course, interns burn out too. Absolutely, they do. And can we get more? Is there a way to make sure that there is a distribution there? And yes, we then need to supervise them. And yes, that creates a whole other workload. But, but then can we bring people in, resources? right? Exactly. Are there resources? Are there, you know, people out there who we can bring in during this time to mm -hmm. supervise mm -hmm. um, who are, you know, experts and so on? Yeah. I see a, a recent question in the Q&A that I think is a really good one. Um, what would you say to staff who might be reluctant to ask for support because they notice that their peers or their supervisors themselves are overwhelmed and that asking for help, you know, could potentially make the lives of those people more difficult? So this, I think, is one of the challenges of those of us, of we do this work, we're so busy looking out for other people that we forget ourselves. We're so worried about them. But my guess is that actually reaching out and connecting would be more supportive, would be would allow for more connection, uh, cohesion than than not. That it, that it would not be a burden. It would be a way of connecting and saying, you know what, we're all in this together. How can we support each other? I would completely agree with that. If you're noticing it in others and you're the one that's brave enough to speak up, what a relief for everybody. I just want to draw everyone's attention to the resource sharing in the chat and thank those Fantastic. of you who shared your resources we, so we, far. Meg, can we get those too? Of course you can. I want to see those. I want access <laughs> Me to those too. too. <laughs> No, we, we all need some self-care, really. Exactly. Uh, yes, and, and a word uh, for those who may have missed us at the beginning on uh, what you can expect from us in terms of follow-up. So this webinar is being recorded. The materials that were shared, at least those by Kristen and Inka, we have already planned for uh, you to get an automated Zoom email tomorrow with all those materials. And we will, like Rebecca said, do our best to incorporate other useful materials that we have learned about from you all today. So just uh, thanking everyone for that. I'm looking through the q and I think maybe we can take a final question. I see the top question remaining in the Q&A uh, was related to reported barriers. And I know both of you have done quite a bit of research, so maybe more of a research focused question on how do the barriers that you talked about um, compare between those who are in a refugee service or a human service uh, position um, and, and in other fields. Any thoughts on that? The comparison we did was human service field overall. And the surprise that I had actually was that there wasn't a huge difference between people that were in nursing and other sort of general service professions and those with refugee service professions. The big difference, of course, was right now there's such a flurry of changes all the time that there's a lot to stay on top of. Um, and then, of course, add COVID and everything else. So that there is that difference that all of a sudden everything is changing um, every day for, for the last several years. So it's been a little harder. Mm -hmm. But Overall, the experience of, of all of these hazards are similar. As far as with non-service professions, I actually don't know the answer to that. I don't know if you do, Yinka. I'm sorry, as the, what was that last piece? 
Um, what, for people in non-service professions uh, experiencing burnout, are the rates similar or are they different? I don't know the answer to that. I, I mean, that's where we get into burnout versus compassion fatigue versus vicarious trauma. I mean, with, with the work that we're talking about is it's listening to the trauma stories, hearing those traumatic experiences that makes a difference. It's not just the, you know, every day clocking in and, and the job, it's the trauma piece is what adds to it. Um, and, and, and again, just to kind of, you know, support what you just said, Kristen, about the refugee population, I, I think that one of the big stressors, the additional stressors has been just, you know, the, the, the changes legally, that's added a whole other level of stress, you know, um, in terms of immigration. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you both for that. And I think because we have a few minutes remaining, we will move into uh, two final discussion questions. If you'll bear with me while I find the slide. So yeah, the questions are that we have for you. The first one is, what's the first step that you can take within your organization to increase support for staff care? Or what's one step your organization can take to increase staff care? It might be worth thinking about this, even if it takes a minute, because mm -hmm. when you go away from here, I'm hoping that what you will do is go back to your leadership and say, I just listened to this webinar and you know what would be really helpful is if we started this one thing, assessing workloads and priorities with a real world lens. I love that. Yes, that is a good first step. Mm -hmm create a safe space for people to talk about self-care. I love that, yes. Yep. Going through the who, what, when, where, yep. Trying to help people feel not judged or inadequate. I love this. And, that, and that's really important because often it's like, well, I have to be strong for my clients, for other mm -hmm. people, but you know, again, we also have, we also need to have good care taken of us in order to do the work that we do and to do it well. Exactly, exactly. And in the interest of time, we're gonna ask one last question. So what is one step you can take to improve your own self-care? What's something you could do even this week to improve your self-care? Sleep hygiene. sleep hygiene. Yes. <laughs> Commit to not working over the holiday. Okay, people, that airplane button on your phones, turn it on. Give yourself <laughs> exactly. a break. It's okay to check out. I love mm -hmm. this. Five, mm -hmm. ten minutes. Go for a walk. Yes. Mm -hmm. Listen Watching to some meetings, good music. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, shut it down. Yep. Watch a sunset. I love that. That's one of my favorites too. Oh, I love the dancing one too. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so it's possible. It can be done. These are, these are not expensive, big things, just little, little steps. Right. Yeah. Spend times with our pets. Absolutely. Go snuggle that little furry friend there. These are such fabulous replies. Thank you so much again, everyone. I'm going to conclude and, and wrap us up here with our final minute uh, to ensure we don't take any more of all the valuable time of everyone joining us today. But I wanna say a huge, huge, huge thank you to our facilitators, Yinka and Kristen. It has been such a joy through. and a pleasure. Oh, I'm so glad. Exactly, I echo that. Uh, 
And, and as well to all of you for joining, I, I really appreciate you modeling what a collaborative and supportive space can look like on this call um, and would really encourage you to continue to engage with each other and with Switchboard. You have our contact information on here. As we mentioned, you'll get materials from us over email, but we also um, would be very happy to hear from you if you want to reach out to us the other way. So um, don't hesitate. I will put a final plug before we close to please complete our feedback survey. Uh, it will likely already be open in your web browser, depending on how you joined this webinar. And Rebecca just put the link into the chat. That survey is really helpful to us as we try to make our trainings as useful as possible to you going forward. I'll go ahead and wrap up there, but thank you so much uh, once again to everyone for joining and really have a great rest of your day. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving break, everyone. Yeah, enjoy. Take care Bye. of yourselves. Thank you. Bye.